शिव शक्तुक्त यदि शक्त प्रभावित न चेदेव देव न खलु कुशल स्पंदी अथस्वाध्यंग हरिहर विरिंचादिरपी प्रणंतुम स्तोतुम वाकतमकृतपुण्या प्रभवती Namaste. So to continue our series on the ontology of Shakti. What actually is the meaning of Shakti? And you'll be surprised that there is no one meaning. And the reason for that is people are on different levels and they will interpret the meaning differently. So in every Sanskrit scripture, every Vedic scripture, there are multiple levels of interpretation. It has to be like that because people are seeing with a different view. Here's our good old chart again showing the four basic views. Dvaita vada, vishishta dvaita vada, vivarta vada and ajata vada. So the people on these different platforms are going to see things differently because their point of view is different. The people in Dvaita Vada are basically on the platform of the body and the senses. They think the world is real. They think that that God is somebody like them, you know, a person like them uh who has an eternal form. or an eternal body and and like that and then there's the people in vishishta dvaita vada who see the world as real but temporary and that at some point it's going to disappear and uh, back into brahman and so all forms including the form of shiva and shakti are temporary then there's the people in vivarta vada who understand that the whole world is just an appearance. It's an appearance, it's an illusion, and its reality is only the reality of the underlying consciousness, Brahman. And finally there's the people in Ajata Vada whose view is that this material world, this world of name and form was never born. it doesn't even really exist all that exists is an appearance in brahman so now what do we mean really when we're talking about brahman shiva shakti all these things huh? well brahman is non-dual in other words it's one there's no boundary and because there's no boundary it's infinite because isn't the definition of finite something that has a limit that has a boundary that has an end and there is no end there is no limit to pure objectless awareness and that is brahman and then shiva means when brahman apparently develops duality within itself which of course is impossible but it happens anyway <laughs> then brahman is divided apparently divided into shiva and shakti actually there is no division and the way that advaita philosophy explains this is that the world doesn't really exist it's just a mirage like the water seen in a desert so the mirage appears but it's not real it's a real mirage <laughs> so in the sense that duality only appears within brahman shiva and shakti are separate actually they're one 
And this was proven after, you know, the origin story of, uh, of Arunachala, that Shiva appeared as an Agni Lingam, huh? a column of fire. Well, Lingam doesn't exactly mean column, but <laughs> we'll let that pass. Anyway, <laughs> so Vishnu and Brahma wanted to see where's the end, where's the limit. And Vishnu went down in his boar form, and Brahma went up in his swan form, and neither of them could find the limit. See, Shiva is Brahman. There is no difference. But all forms, all appearances, are generated by Shakti. So, these appearances can be limited or unlimited, or they can be anything, <laughs> anything she wants. So anyway, after this pastime, when both Vishnu and uh, Brahma were defeated by Shiva, <laughs> then Shakti came to Shiva and circumambulated him and said, look, let's show the world that we're really one. Let's appear in a form which is half you and half me. So there was generated the Arandharashwar form. Here it is. This form is half Shiva and half Shakti. One body with two apparent identities. But actually they're one. So what does this mean? It means that the language of the Vedas, the language of the scriptures, Sanskrit language, is a symbolic language. It's a multi-ordinal language. That's a term coined by Korzybski, Alfred Korzybski, the great founder of modern semantics. That means a term with numerous simultaneous meanings. And it just depends on how you look at it. It just depends on your point of view, what it means for you. So this is why the scriptures talk in parables. They talk in metaphors. They talk in stories. They don't come out and say analytically, huh, like we do, that the world is just an appearance in Brahman. They don't say that because that would uh, make it impossible for the people in Dvaita Vada to understand. And out of that, they would reject the scriptures and they would be lost. So the scriptures use a metaphorical language, a secret language, which doesn't really give the meanings Huh? but shows the relationships between these things, like Shiva and Shakti. See, by showing that Shiva and Shakti are one, but different at the same time, huh? this also gives support to the Dvaita Dvaita, or Vishishta Dvaita, or uh, Bheda Bheda philosophy, the, the second platform. And by showing that Shiva is unlimited, whereas the demigods are uh, limited, they can't reach the end of Shiva. Shiva is shown to be actually the supreme. Uh, actually, he's Brahman. And so, but, but it's not stated directly, you see. It's stated in the form of a story. Shiva appeared as the Agni Lingam, and then... Brahma and Vishnu tried to find his limits, but they couldn't. So the meaning of the story has to be brought out for the particular audience. Otherwise, the people in the lower levels may become discouraged, or they may reject the scriptures entirely, which would be bad for them. So we have to let them have their understanding, see? This is, this is why I love uh, the Shakta uh, 
cult <laughs> or religion. <laughs> it's not really a religion, but anyway. The Shaktas allow, accept, and support all points of view. Even the lower points of view. Even the people who reject Shiva and Shakti, like the Vaishnavas. Huh? The Vaishnavas have to make up an elaborate story. <laughs> well, they call themselves Vaishnavas. If they were really Vaishnavas, they would be on the Vishishta Dvaita platform. But most of the so-called Vaishnavas are Dvaita Vadis. And so being in duality, they want to have a permanent identity. They say the soul, the individual, is eternal. Well, <laughs> anything that is born has to die. Anything that comes into being at a certain point has to go out of being at another point. That's just the way it is. I mean, that's just reality, you know? So <laughs> any individual who appears at a certain point in time will also disappear. What's the problem with that? Well, it's only a problem if your philosophy says that we have to have something, some form that's eternal. So they say God is eternal, Vishnu is eternal, and so is the soul. But, of course, this leads to insurmountable philosophical problems. So they have to invent things like the idea of Vaikuntha, which is not given in the Vedas, uh, is not a part of the Upanishads. It's not discussed in Vedanta. <laughs> but they have to invent this in order to give Vishnu a place to be eternal. Uh, Vishnu and the Jivas that, that they imagine are eternal. You see? But it's clearly stated in even in the Vaishnava scriptures. Huh? The Brahma Samhita uh, says that what, what is Vishnu? What is his body made of? Sat Chit Ananda Vigraha. Sat Chit Ananda. Ishwara Parama Krishna. Sat Chit Ananda Vigraha. Right? Anadir, Adir, Govinda, Sarva, Karana, Karana. But the, the clue here is Sat Chit Ananda. If, if Krishna or Vishnu's body is Sat Chit Ananda, then where does that Sat Chit Ananda come from? See? So Sat means existence, eternal truth, right? And the only eternal truth is Brahman, according to Vedas, according to Upanishads. And chit means consciousness. Well, what is consciousness? Consciousness is the chit shakti. And chit shakti is Devi. You see? And Ananda, she is also Ananda. These are all part of her thousand names. And I think I'm going to start a series on the thousand names of the goddess. Lalita Sahasranam. Because all of these subtle points are explained therein. And then you can go back to the other scriptures and see the real meaning. Huh? Because it's in code. It lets you misinterpret it if you need to, to uh, support or stay within the boundaries of your particular platform. So if you want to have an, an eternal form, okay, fine, you can have it. <laughs> of course, you can't really have it, but you can imagine that you have it. And the Vedas will support that as a temporary means to get you on the path, to get you performing puja, to get you chanting mantras, to get you doing the sadhana, the austerities that lead to actual advancement on the path. See? Then once you develop real love for God, prema, then you, or rasa in the beginning, then you graduate to vishishta dvaita, and you start to see that, well, maybe this world isn't real anyway. You know? <laughs> like the Srimad Bhagavatam, the favorite scripture, of the Dvaita Vadi Vaishnavas begins in the first verse 
with the statement that this material world appears real. Huh? Vivarta. It appears real, even to demigods and great sages, but actually it's an illusion. It says it right there. <laughs> And then goes on and on for 18,000 shlokas talking about the forms of this world. So anyway, the language of the Vedas is a symbolic language. It's couched in the form of stories. But those stories have a deep philosophical meaning. You have to be able to tease it out. That means you have to have the key which is the knowledge given by the realized sages. Aum Tatsat. Aum Harihi Aum.